Thank you, Manuel, and thank you for coming. Um, I have um, the job to start this, uh, this session, so I hope that uh, I can do a good job with this. Um, the, for the next 45 minutes, I will take some time to talk about seismic retrofitting, and uh, I will focus mainly on uh, those buildings that really need retrofitting, so buildings that have been designed pre-seismic um, code. Uh, so we're talking mainly of uh, reinforced concrete buildings and buildings that uh, are very prone and uh, prominent in uh, developing countries. Uh, I need to acknowledge my co-authors because they did um, actually most of the work that I will be presenting today. And um, I will um, go through a brief introduction first, just to set the scene, uh, discuss a uh, typical deficiency that we can find in uh, reinforced concrete buildings, how FRP can uh, uh, help in uh, resolving some of the issues, and then uh, I will give you some case studies uh, coming from research and uh, a, a couple of uh, buildings that we tested on, uh, on a shake table. Uh, where we employed um, composite materials to address some of the uh, most important issues that we typically see in uh, reinforced concrete buildings. Um, we know, and unfortunately, that um, uh, earthquake hazard is uh, uh, one of the natural disasters that uh, we, we have to deal with, we have to cope with. Uh, if you look at figures in terms of uh, mortality, um, I have estimated here about 50,000 per year, but then again, the statistic might change depending on how many years you consider of earthquake um, um, actions, so I looked at uh, back in 2001. And again, even, even if it is a high number, it doesn't really compare with uh, uh, other problems you might have, even with uh, car accidents, which are uh, manifold times this. Uh, but then again, you can have um, earthquake that really cripples the country, and then, um, like, like for instance, happened in Haiti, um, where a, a, a magnitude 7 earthquake really created uh, a, a disaster of an enormous magnitude for, uh, for that country, and then cripple them financially and uh, politically. Um, so we need to deal with this, and um, uh, we can have um, uh, very high earthquake risks that uh, don't lead to the same uh, type of damages. Um, and r the risk, we really need to understand that is a, um, a, a, a product of hazard and vulnerability. So even if you have the same uh, concrete, uh, the same earthquake that strike a, a certain area, uh, like it, for instance happened in uh, um, uh, recently in Italy, we have um, a series of consequences that uh, and, and different buildings respond in different ways. So buildings are um, unique in entities and are subjected to um, a different level of seismic risk. So you can find a situation like this, where you find uh, a, a series of um, construction that has been completely demolished, so they were very highly vulnerable to that type of um, uh, earthquake that struck that, uh, that, uh, that area. Whilst in the same area, you might have uh, buildings still standing, so with a lower vulnerability. Still um, uh, risky uh, in terms of um, uh, the uh, occupancy that uh, they might offer to, um, to the public, uh, but then they can actually stand a, a certain amount of um, earthquake level. So it's um, um, those uh, different uh, differences in the different type of buildings and different uh, uh, building classes that we need to understand that we need to try to address when uh, when we do our strengthening intervention. So we need to first of all understand if we need strengthening. Sometimes strengthening is uh, really not an option, and we need to uh, start from scratch, demolish, and uh, rebuild. Uh, but most of the time, strengthening can reduce the vulnerability, uh, the seismic vulnerability of buildings, and uh, uh, save life in the long term. There are different ways we can uh, adopt, different strategies we can adopt to strengthen existing buildings. Uh, depending on the type of building that we start with, we might have um, a, a stiff and weak building, or we might have a very flexible and weak building, and then we want to, stre to uh, strengthen and to increase or to reduce that vulnerability. Um, so we, can, we need to uh, de design, we need to un understand the type of um, intervention that is more um, uh, useful for that type of um, building and application, and then adopt the correct strategy, which uh, can also, well, we, is generally also a combination of um, cost, social aspects. So um, uh, if we had in mind uh, developing countries, there might be some technology which might be the most appropriate maybe to use in terms of um, uh, technical results, but the cost doesn't really uh, fit in with the, um, with, the, with the social environment and with the uh, economic welfare of the, of the countries where we're trying to operate. So there are, the, there are many 
option to increase the or to decrease the vulnerability uh, of buildings and to, to do the seismic strengthening. Uh, we can look at uh, techniques or strategies that will increase it, that will address stiffness issues. Um, and if we talk about FRPs, increasing flexural uh, behavior that uh, could increase strength, but it could also address some of the stiffness issues. And um, we, if, um, if you're familiar with the use of FRPs in um, uh, strengthening application, plate bonding uh, is one of the techniques where FRP are actually going very strong um, in, in, in current times. Uh, if we want to address um, strength, uh, then again, we can select a different type of strategies. And uh, when looking at FRPs, I will go into more details later on in these uh, applications, where we can look at um, uh, confinement, um, which is um, really addressing quite a few issues in terms of se seismic behavior that are very beneficial um, to, to the strengthening um, improvement that we want to address. Uh, or we can look at um, uh, giving flexibility, I call it there, we can call it uh, deformability, ductility, uh, and again, confinement we see come in as, a, as one of the techniques that is actually very desirable to, uh, to obtain this um, uh, type of increased capacity. When we I look at strengthening reinforced concrete and um, with this new technology, with FRP technology, we generally think of um, um, composites that are attached to the surface of the specimens or, or the elements, like uh, uh, externally bonded reinforcement, uh, generally called EBR um, in uh, German terminology. Uh, so where you have really plates, strips uh, or sheets of composite material glued to the soffit of a beam, um, or a slab, uh, or you can have um, a similar technique where they make use of the concrete cover, where they cut slit into the concrete cover, as you can see here, and insert bars or strip, again to um, enhance the capacity. And you can enhance both the flexural capacity of elements, um, if you are if uh, increasing the amount of flexural enforcement that you, that you originally had, uh, in your um, um, starting structure. So these are some applications of how FRP can be uh, attached to structures to increase their flexural strength. Or they can also be used to increase their shear capacity. Again, similar techniques, we can use uh, externally bonded reinforcement, just attached to sides of a beam in this case to increase the shear capacity. Or we can use the near surface mounted um, technique, cutting slits to, through the concrete cover and increase in embedding bars or strips, again, to achieve uh, a similar um, uh, benefit of increasing shear capacity. Though all of these techniques have uh, pros and cons, depending on the type of uh, structure you, are, uh, you wanted to rehabilitate and the type of limitation you might have also from the architectural point of view. Um, and then we have confinement, uh, which I guess I will spend most of the time uh, discussing in this presentation, because it's one of the techniques that uh, uh, can help uh, remediate or mitigate uh, some of the most important issues that we can find in um, seismic deficient structures. And uh, confinement is um, um, very simply uh, packs an element and uh, increases its uh, capacity by confining the lateral expansion. Uh, and we, we can have um, a very uh, powerful um, enhancement, an increase in capacity and ductility. We'll see it when we get to the element level. And uh, by confining a section, we can increase strength up to 200% or even more, but generally it's not uh, advisable to increase strength uh, too much when we're dealing with structures, because then we move problems uh, somewhere else in the structure. They can increase ductility or deformability, uh, which is, again, a very um, important uh, property to have in uh, seismic deficient structures. And But they can also help with other issues, like they can uh, confine the area where you have um, uh, short lap splices because of uh, poor detailing in the original structure, so they can help out with that. And they can also restrain the river buckling. Again, they can, uh, they can address several issues looking at strength, ductility, and also mitigate some other problems that might uh, impair the, um, uh, the capacity or restrain the capacity of the elements that were originally designed. Um, so when we go to typical, just to summarize, when we go to typical um, structural deficiencies that we find in uh, building in developing countries or in our areas, in buildings that were designed pre-arrival uh, of seismic codes, 
The most um, uh, typical type of issues that we notice are uh, dealing with the, uh, mainly with the joints um, that we have in our structures because most of the problems are coming in the detailing. So detailing wasn't really looked at um, in, a, in a very good way or in a very thorough way before the advent of seismic codes. Um, we might have um, poor um, anchorage of, um, of bars coming from the beams into the column. So if these bars go straight into the column and it's not really anchored, so the, there will be um, the possibility of that bar to slip uh, as soon as you have quite significant actions okay, imposed on that, uh, on that join. Uh, that will reduce also the capacity of the beam, so you might not uh, uh, have your uh, strong column weak beam type of um, um, action happening. Or you have um, links that are spaced at a very large uh, spacing, so again, without providing enough confinement to the, to the concrete, to the column, or to the joint itself. Like in this case, we have no um, stirrups within the joint, so that again, the joint is not confined and it's very vulnerable um, to seismic actions. Or we can even go down to the material properties, uh, where we can have a very poor material, uh, and a poor material with a concrete strength of lower than 20 or 15 MPa in some cases, uh, can obviously make your, um, um, your structure very vulnerable uh, to seismic hazard. So these are some of the issues, or these are the typical issues that we see in um, uh, reinforced concrete buildings in developing country or that were not designed with uh, uh, to appropriate uh, seismic uh, codes. And uh, these are actually some of the issues that we can uh, address with the use of FRPs. Um, and how can we use FRP to help our structures to increase uh, or to decrease the vulnerability to decrease the seismic um, capacity? Um, I, I will go through uh, a series of tests that we've done at, uh, at the University of Sheffield and obviously other colleagues have done um, uh, around the world to examine how FRPs can be used to address uh, some of these issues. And I will start with the small elements and I will progressively go into uh, larger elements to uh, end up with a full building to see how the FRPs uh, can actually be used uh, in practical applications. So we start with um, um, exploring how confinement so just simply wrapping FRPs around the section can help in increasing the lap splice strength. Um, so we start, uh, we, we've done a, a series of tests on beams where we tested in four point bending, so in pure flexion, where the middle bars were spliced in the middle and we provided a splice length that is much smaller than uh, what, is, um, um, what, what, what would comply with the um, regular codes to develop the full strength and to be able to yield the bar. So the, with the idea of um, um, failing in the splice length and then uh, try to address this issue by using confinement, we use a series of different type of confi different uh, schemes of, for the confinement. Uh, we use um, no confinement at all, and that is the type of failure that uh, we led to. So we will have um, uh, spalling of the concrete within the, the splice length. Then we use uh, internal stirrups to confine the area where we have the splice. Um, but obviously trying to um, also address issues that of detailing, so poor detailing to see what uh, the uh, enhancement can be even uh, by putting large space. And this is, if you notice the cracks here, the, this will appear where the, the stirrups are. So considering the uh, splice line that we have in the type of elements is uh, put a, at a large spacing. And then we use um, uh, FRPs to confine the section, to provide confinement. Uh, we use one layer of carbon fibers or two layers of carbon fibers uh, and uh, examine the influence that they had on um, the ability of that um, beam to deflect, take a moment before uh, failing in the splicing. And this is a summary of, uh, we, we did a series of tests in looking at uh, different parameters, different type of uh, bar diameters, different splice length. This is just a, a slide summarizing a, a few tests on uh, a, a bar uh, a 16 millimeter bar um, with uh, a 27 millimeter cover. So we were looking at uh, di bar diameter to cover ratio to induce spalling. And uh, the little star that you see here is the failure load of the original beam. So without confinement, just with a poor splice length. So that beam failed in a brittle manner in the splice along the splice line because of uh, concrete spalling. And then we um, added a confinement through internal stirrups, and that's the this black line 
black dash line. So we increase slightly the capacity, but we, are, we, we obtain a more ductile behavior. So we didn't have that brittle collapse that we had in the, uh, in the previous beam. And then by adding uh, FRPs, we, we were able to increase the capacity with one layer, this is the green line that you see here. Two layers, that's the purple line. So we increase the capacity considerably consist, um, considering the original beam. But we also increase the, the ductility and the energy dissipation that uh, we could provide with that, uh, with that element. So by just adding one layer of confinement, we were already able to increase the capacity of that beam and to prevent or delay the issues uh, linked to the uh, poor lab splice detailing that we had in the original beam. And just for a comparison, this is the uh, equivalent beam with um, uh, continuous reinforcement at the bottom, so without using any splice length. And that would be the maximum capacity that beam could achieve. So by using FRP as a confinement, we, would be, we were able to um, almost yield, uh, well, we, we, we started to yield the bar when, when using two layers of, um, of FRP. So we're reaching basically the maximum capacity that we could um, obtain from the bar. The same graph, just looking into a different way, if you look at um, bond bar slip, the same uh, exact specimens, uh, the, again, the star will uh, show you the average bond strength that could be developed by the splice length poorly detailed. And that uh, bond strength increase when, when, incre when including one layer or two layer of, uh, of FRP to almost uh, or to, to slightly yield the bar in this case. So that uh, suggests that um, adding more layers of reinforcement of FRPs in addition to those two that we provided wouldn't increase much the, well, it wouldn't, incre wouldn't increase the capacity, will, uh, however, offer some uh, additional ductility. So depending on the um, type of um, results that you have in mind, you can also tailor the confinement um, the strategy and the confinement solution to obtain um, the, the results uh, that, you, that you need for that structure. So when we look at um, CFRP confinement in terms of um, lap splice length and how to mitigate this, um, uh, these issues, the CFRP can delay you know, the splitting failure uh, of substandard slabs, which is good news when we look at uh, seismic application, and can enhance uh, considerably even the, the bone strength and uh, increase the bar slip. Or sometimes uh, being able to develop the full yield strength of the, of the bar. Um, now we move up uh, a scale higher and we look at joint. Again, joint are a very critical and crucial um, um, part of any structure. And uh, we've, again, we've done a similar, um, a, a, a experimental program that follows similar lines. So we, we had a, a poorly designed joint. This is the original joint. So we tested it upside down in the next slide. So I, I kind of rotated it to make it look more like a column beam joint. Uh, so this is the column and the beam. In the previous slides, it was uh, rotating 90 degrees because it was just easier to, to test in our facilities. Um, but we've, um, in this experimental program, we looked at uh, typical issues that you might have in substandard uh, buildings. So we looked at different detailing of the bars going into the joint. So these are the three type of detailings that we, that we tested. So very poor um, anchorage of the bars coming from the beam into the column where we have a straight bar and a, a hook end on the top bar. Again, we, we left a straight bar, but we increased the length of the hook for the top bar to give a, a better confinement, a, a better anchorage. And then we use a, a um, more proper detailing for the confinement of both the bottom and top bars. And we've tested this under cyclic um, loading. Uh, the first tests that were run on the uh, bare joints, so without any confinement, led to a shear failure obviously in the joint. This is what we designed, and this is what we were expecting given the poor detailing of the reinforcement within that, uh, within that joint. And then taking the damaged joint, we started rehabilitating and strengthening with FRPs. So the first operation that we did was um, to recast the, the core of the joint, which is typical operation that is done in um, a seismic upgrade or in upgrade of, of any structure when you have uh, severe damage like the one we were obtained during, during the test. So this is simple replacing of the concrete. We use um, a, a higher strength concrete than the concrete that was originally used for the, for the specimens. So we, test, we started from a 20 MPA concrete that was the original concrete used for the joint 
but we replace it with the 15 MPa concrete for the uh, for the core. Uh, so again, providing additional shear capacity to the core and thus increasing the capacity uh, of that joint. We did a test on that just to see what the effect of having this um, infill uh, would would do, and then we retrofitted again that uh, this joint with <coughs> FRPs. So we put um, again we we are using carbon FRPs. Uh, I'll show you um, in the next slide the, the layout of the FRP and how we use it and how we place it to see what the effect of using FRP on the uh, re rehabilitated uh, joints, so the joint originally broken and with their core replaced uh, was with FRPs. So this is the uh, strengthening strategy that we use for FRP. So we use FRP in both the flexural directions to increase the flexural capacity of the column and we also use it to confine the end of the beam going into the joint, as well as to confine the end, the two ends of the column in this side of the, of the joint. So we use both the combination of flexural strengthening and uh, confinement uh, by applying uh, simply FRP sheets, carbon fiber sheets. Obviously this was done after the core, the original core was uh, um, taken off and um, recast with stronger, uh, with um, higher strength concrete. So if you look at the uh, load displacement, or load drift ratio capacity of, this, uh, of these elements, we start from the top left where we have our bare joint, uh, where we can barely reach a drift of 3% um, and about a, a load of 60 kilonewton. And at that point, um, uh, the shear uh, capacity of that joint was reached, so the joint started to um, be damaged um, in, a very, in a very high way, manner, so we couldn't uh, really save it. And when we had the strength degradation of about 80 or 75 percent, we stopped the test. We replaced the core with the high strength concrete, and that takes us to this response. So again, we increased the, both the load capacity and the drift capacity of that joint, but we weren't able to reach the yield load of the, uh, so we were unable to, to use the beam in in a proper way and to yield the bars in, the, in, that, uh, in that joint. And uh, after that, we uh, confined the joint with the FRPs, and this is the final result of that um, uh, test. So in this case, we are increasing substantially, especially if you compare it to the original joint, both the um, strength capacity, the load capacity, as well as the drift ratio, we reached drift of 5%, which uh, is more than we really need uh, in, uh, in any seismic application. Uh, but we also were able to yield the reinforcement in the bar, so achieving uh, really the goal that, that uh, we wanted to achieve in, in terms of the strategy that we uh, adopted for the strengthening. And just as a comparison, to show you the higher capacity and also the uh, larger uh, energy dissipation that we could obtain uh, by using this um, simple uh, strengthening technique. So. FRP or specific um, confinement by using FRPs um, in joint application can help in enhance the capacity, it can enhance the drift, um, again, all good things in a seismic application, and it can again lead to yielding of the reinforcement to changing the, the failure mode and uh, make it so that uh, uh, it can help the structure uh, sustain higher seismic um, uh, activities. Um, it has to be said that um, uh, you can strengthen uh, to a very high degree the core and reach uh, at very high load the crushing of the of the core inside the, the FRP. Uh, so if, when that happens, uh, you're, you're obviously limiting the uh, amount of plastic deformation that you can have in the bar within the joint. So you, are, uh, you have a limit in, uh, in terms of the application of, um, of FRPs and you don't want to overdo it in, uh, uh, increasing, uh, in adding too much FRPs and increasing the strength uh, to a degree that it cannot actually be utilized by the whole structure. So this, again, is, is part of the design process and we need to have in mind uh, where we need to go, where the strengthening um, that you have in mind will take you and where it needs to take the structure so that we can adopt the right uh, material and the right um, uh, strengthening strategies. Um, looking, so we, we, FRPs can be very beneficial in, incre in mitigating um, a lot of the issues that we can have with um, poor detailing increasing capacity and adding utility, all of which are very good in a seismic application. So we take, we took it uh, to the next level and see and apply to um, real building, well I would say real building, but these are large scale buildings, 
uh, that we um, prepare the manufacturer to following, again, poor detailing rules to, to have something that is representative of buildings that uh, we can find in developing countries or in France and Italy before uh, the, the advent of um, seismic codes. And we've uh, tested them in, on the um, shaking table. These two projects were both funded by Ceres, which is uh, funded by the European Commission, and is looking at is, is a, a, a program that shares facilities within uh, uh, Europe to run tests um, such as this. This test was actually done here in, in France, um, in, um, uh, at the um, Laboratoire Saclay, uh, on the Azali ta shaking table test, which is one of the biggest uh, in, in Europe. It's a six by six uh, meter table and you can act in uh, six degree of freedom. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to have two projects on that, uh, on that table, so we, we were able to um, do quite a, a good study on the effect of using FRP for confining uh, joints and to rehabilitating uh, reinforced concrete buildings, but it also gave us an opportunity of explore different type of um, strengthening techniques, and I will touch on this um, um, in my presentation um, briefly. So I'll start with the, with the first building. Uh, this uh, was the, the Eco Leader building. Uh, it's a reinforced concrete building uh, that we prepared, again, with the aim to, uh, affect the fact, to um, examine the effectiveness of using CFRP for uh, strengthening deficient buildings. Uh, it's 6.6 um, .6 meter high, so it's 3.3 .3 each, um, each story. Uh, and it's 4.26 times 4.26, so it's a square um, footprint. The columns are 26 by 26 centimeters. The beams are all the same in all direction, 26 by 40 centimeters, just to have a, a stronger column, a stronger beam than, uh, than the columns, just to have a, 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 again, a weakness that we can explore and, um, and see how we can uh, remediate with FRTs. And we tried to use a very low strength concrete, but the minimum that we could get was about 21 MPA, uh, which is stronger than what we wanted, but it's really difficult uh, nowadays to manufacture a very poor concrete. And also it was very, it was very difficult to get all the um, old steel bars, so we had to use the regular steel bars that we use, but we used a smaller diameter bar than uh, you would use in uh, uh, proper construction. So this is just roughly to give you an idea of the cross-section and the type of reinforcement that we use. Again, we use a very poor detailing of the joints, uh, where we wanted to concentrate most of the damage and the problems because this is where typically uh, construction is uh, uh, is poor or where the uh, most problems with the uh, manufacturing and construction of buildings appear and uh, on this test on this building in particular we did uh, we ran nine tests uh, so two phases one on the bare building so as built to create a certain level of damage um, then then we can uh, we could repair with, with FRP, and then we ran a second phase of uh, tests on the repair building. And we uh, applied uh, different uh, intensity of earthquake, varying uh, PGA. From 0 0.05, we went all the way up to 0.5 for the strengthened building. But for the bare building, we stopped at 0.4, because at that point, um, really, we, we couldn't, um, uh, we, we, we had already reached a level of damage that was irreparable otherwise. Uh, I'll try to run this video. This will, will show you the um, a test, the last test of the first phase on the bare building. So this is a 0.4G. Um, you will see the full view of the building on your left and the, uh, and the zoom in of the joint on the right. It will start. It should start. Yes. So that, that was a 0.4G applied on that building. Um, if you see, and if you're wondering maybe what um, some of the parts of the buildings are, um, which 
you might not see here, but you saw in the video, are, um, uh, and you saw below the, the top story, uh, below the roof of the top story are also ducts that we were, also, a, a, another project was testing, uh, so they were testing components and the suddenly performance of components, so we use the same building to, to run different projects. Uh, but after this, um, uh, point 0.4G applied to, the, to this building, we reached a substantial damage, and most of the damage was con concentrated at the test floor um, joints and the columns. So then we took the building and uh, we rehabilitated that building using um, uh, inje resin injections in the, in the cracks. And, um, and then after that, uh, we patched and repaired the concrete where we had concrete falling off. And after the uh, basic repair or rehabilitation, we applied um, strengthening with um, carbon fibers in, uh, in a similar way as we uh, rehabilitated the joint that we tested in the lab, so using a similar technique. And this is the uh, strengthening strategy or the layout of uh, FRP that we applied, again, supplying um, flexure reinforcement as well as confinement uh, to the columns and to uh, the portion at the end of the beams going into the joint. So these are the uh, detailing for the joints at the first floor and the joint at the second floor. And that's the look of the building uh, after it's been strengthened. So all the joints were strengthened with FRP. Yeah, I was talking about this parts of the building here. Uh, this is not mass. It, it, this is a duct that uh, uh, was attached to the... Well, it, it provides a little mass, but it's not um, a, a heavy uh, type of load. It's just a duct, a, an air duct that was um, being tested by a different company. And after we've um, strengthened the building with uh, carbon fibers, we ran a second series of tests and uh, we pushed the building up to 0.5G. So again, I will show you the test, the, this last test on the, on the building. And unfortunately, this, uh, I have to say now, we couldn't damage the building. So we went to 0.5 and we couldn't really, but well, we, you will see quite a lot of uh, uh, shaking of the building, but we couldn't damage because we reached the maximum um, displacement of the table. Yeah, a little bit of a long introduction. And after the 0.5G, we, we went and inspected the building, and we really didn't see uh, major damage in the joints. And there was very little damage of, uh, in the CFRP, a very uh, limited uh, sign of debonding, uh, but nothing major. And the rehabilitation uh, technique that we used, so the injection of the um, cracks, the replacement of the concrete with the addition of the FRP, uh, really uh, was able to increase the capacity of the original building and uh, without um, um, inducing a, a significant damage on the building itself. The, we, we were able to reach drifts that are higher than uh, uh, recommended of the, in, in the codes, but the amount of uh, damage really related to those um, type of drifts were minimal. Uh, so on the basis of um, uh, these first case studies, then uh, we went further and we designed a second building. Uh, we wanted to explore also different um, uh, technologies um, one of the main aims that we have um, also at the University of Sheffield is to look really into technologies that can be adopted by developing countries. Um, we have um, uh, people coming and do research with us from countries like Pakistan, uh, Nepal, uh, Indonesia. And uh, when they come, they, they're very interested in using FRPs, but they also uh, sometimes are concerned that uh, cost might be an implication when they go back to that country. Um, so we, uh, although FRPs has really proven that uh, it can uh, mitigate quite a lot of um, issues uh, when it comes to seismic applications, and uh, it can prove um, cost-effective in uh, some cases, or in, most of, in, some, in, in a variety of cases, there are some cases where cost is prohibitive, or um, there is not enough um, um, knowledge and education in a certain country to be able to apply such, such technologies, so that we're always looking into uh, alternatives. Um, so this building was designed 
um, to to look into this and to look at um, um, FRPs, so it, like what I guess we can consider traditional in in the Western world to be applied is for seismic retrofitting, but also a, a, a cheaper technique. Uh, you see here PTMS, that's uh, post-tension metal strapping that I will just introduce briefly. And we wanted to compare how these two technologies can uh, uh, increase the seismic capacity. The building, uh, this bonded building, is um, uh, very similar to the building that uh, we've seen before, with the only difference that uh, the beams are different in the two directions because we wanted the, the first uh, building we only excited in one direction on the table. This building we excited in both directions. So we wanted to try a different strengthening strategy in the two directions. And then we also ran a series of um, uh, 3D te uh, tests where we excited in X, Y, and Z direction also to try and actually damage the building um, as much as we could. Um, the, again, the, the poor detailing that we had uh, in the previous um, specimens are here as well. So we have poor detailing in the joints, and those are the places that we wanted to, to address with our strengthening strategies. And uh, for this um, building, we ran a series of 29 tests uh, in five phases. So we had the bare building, which we uh, damaged, and we pushed to um, a, a, a 0.5G acceleration. That was uh, uh, an acceleration that induced quite a consistent, uh, considerable damage in the bare frame, so that we, uh, uh, but not too much that we could still repair it and, uh, and explore the use of um, post-tension metal straps and the CFRP. And we ran a test on the post-tension metal straps on their own, and then on a combination of uh, post-tension metal straps and CFRP um, as strengthening rehabilitation. And uh, we pushed it all the way to 0.6 G, so already showing that uh, the strengthening strategy we apply, bringing it from 0.15 uh, with severe damage to 0.6 with limited damage um, show the, the potential of this type of um, uh, strengthening strategies. Uh, just briefly on the post tension metal straps, it's um, different from CFRP, uh, but not that different in terms of the uh, results that you obtain in the sense of the mechanics. Uh, it's, you are still talking about confinement. Instead of FRPs, we use a metal strap, same that uh, we, you, you would be using the packaging industry uh, to seal packs. So the metal straps are a high yield steel and you can use um, a very simple tool to wrap them around the column, in this case, and strengthen and pre-stress them, and then uh, close them and secure them with uh, metal clips. So this does uh, the same job as uh, confining with the internal stirrups or using FRPs, um, and they are um, relatively cheaper than, than using FRPs, so they could be attractive in, in some markets. Um, but they, they, they prove to be fairly efficient in uh, increasing seismic capacity. Um, so for this building, I'll show you the first um, test that we've done on the um, bare building, so without any strengthening. Uh, this was um, the, this is the last test we did on the bare building at 0.15G. And after this, we had some um, spalling of the concrete at the at the top. So in the um, in, in the second floor, in uh, in the joints of the second floor and along some of the columns. So we have covered spalling. So we had to uh, strengthen this and patch the the concrete that was uh, that fall off. We applied uh, the post tension metal strapping. This is uh, a picture of what uh, that type of strengthening techniques look like when uh, when it's uh, put in place. And we've done, a, a, so all the joints were strengthened with these uh, techniques. And then we ran a, a second test at, at 0.35G. I will speed this up.
And the point 35G, we had some damage um, along the, uh, some moderate damage in the, in the joint, uh, but not, nothing um, really major. Uh, we reached um, uh, drifts, much higher uh, drift, so at point 35G uh, in, in phase two, when we had uh, the post tension metastraps in one direction, we reached drifts of um, um, about 3%, 2.8%. <coughs> um, when we tested the beam in the opposite direction, we gained a uh, similar type of drifts um, for slightly lower um, lower G because we had uh, uh, less stiffer beams. So we, we are using in the in the weak direction of the um, of the building. So we were um, in the range of drifts that um, um, will be uh, for um, um, performance level um, the for the. Uh, co uh, collapse prevention performance level, but then when you're looking at the um, damage that was actually incurred on the building, wasn't that uh, wasn't correspond to, to that uh, very high level of damage. So we were able to limit the damage uh, to pre preserving the, the deformability of the structure. Um, after we did uh, this uh, test on the PTMS, uh, we went back on the, uh, in one of the frames. We removed the PTMS and we installed CFRP, and then we ran another series of tests with the building uh, strengthened with both PTMS on one frame and uh, carbon fiber on the other frame, so that we could uh, run a comparison on the performance of this. The strategy, again, is similar to what I showed before and for the joint, uh, again, in increasing the flexural capacity and confining with FRPs. Um, one of the slightly different um, uh, technique that we use or detailing that we use is the use of anchors also in the corner to increase uh, the uh, the capacity of those uh, flexural reinforcement. And this is a view of the building. Uh, so half of it was strengthened with uh, PTMS and half of it was strengthened with, uh, with carbon fiber. And we ran uh, a, a new series of tests. Uh, again, we couldn't damage the building or we couldn't uh, take it to collapse. Not that we could because the people that run the shaking table wouldn't have been happy if we did that. Uh, but we were able to, do, uh, to bring it up to 0.6G. And um, to, to test it to the limit, we also applied um, um, seismic action in the uh, three directions. So we, in, in X, we had 100% of the 0.6G, then 0.8% uh, of that in the Y direction, and 0.5%, no, 0.4% in the Z direction. Uh, again, the building survived really well, even this type of uh, motion. And it was quite something to see when, when you're in the lab and, and you see that, uh, that building moving, the, the movement that um, uh, are, are really high and you can appreciate um, how scary it could be to be in, in that situation. But again, the, um, the level of damage that we noticed after inspection of the joints were minimal. Uh, both in the CFRP, we, we really seen um, a, a little of the bonding, but not much else. And some damage in the clips uh, for the metal straps. But again, uh, we were able to successfully strengthen the building uh, to, to, to take uh, very high seismic levels. Um, again, if we, if we look at uh, a comparison of this um, um, final phase of testing, we reached very high drift ratios. So we went to uh, more than 3.6. Um, so we were in the, in the collapse pre prevention area in terms of drift, but again, not uh, inducing a, a corresponding level of damage. And uh, we were able to mobilize also the bars so that they yield uh, to, the, to use um, their capacity at maximum. So the, the strengthening overall was, uh, was very successful and it proved that uh, this technology can be very useful uh, when trying to address all these um, uh, different type of issues that we, we could have in uh, seismic deficient buildings. Um, so in conclusion, uh, just to summarize uh, uh, my previous conclusion, it, it can help in increasing uh, for slab splices in delaying splitting failure uh, of substandard labs, and it can enhance the both, the, both the bone strength and the bar slip. Uh, when you apply to joints, uh, you can enhance the capacity uh, and the drift, and uh, you could 
of obtain yielding of your enforcement if you have a very poor uh, detail enforcement where uh, your body is not uh, well anchored within the joint. And in terms of uh, an overall, when you apply it into a building, um, CFRP can help in uh, mitigating uh, a variety of structural deficiency that joints uh, encourage problems, can control damage very efficiently, and it can increase the capacity. So overall, it's, uh, CFRP uh, can uh, um, be the, a, a solution to several aspects that uh, uh, we're generally considering. Uh, so with this, I, I finished my presentation, and, and I'll, I'll thank you for your attention. And um, I'd like to direct you to um, the page maybe of FIB and, and cost action if you're interested in uh, FRPs and you want to be more involved uh, or have more contact with people working in the field, uh, you can look up at those uh, websites and get more information. Thank you.